So thanks for the introduction. I'm working at One and One, one of the largest web hosters in Europe. We have several ten, ten thousands of servers uh, spread to several data centers. And what I want to talk about is replicating whole data centers. That means uh, if you are an experienced sysadmin, you just think that uh, something working on the paper need not really work in practice. And this is one of the themes I want to talk about. So most of you probably know DRBD, which is the state-of-the-art solution for replicating block devices. Why do I replicate block devices? Because uh, replicating whole data centers is only possible with uh, block device level. If you try it at application level, you are probably lost. Okay, so I, I'm talking about uh, DRBD plus proxy. There's an additional product which is also suited for long distance replication. And my own product, Mars Light. Then I'll talk about the differences uh, uh, in the working model of Mars Light to DRBD. And then the main difference, the behavior at network bottlenecks. And last slide, of course, current status and what's going on. Okay, if you already know DRBD, you know that it's working synchronously and it's typically constructed as a RAID 1 over network. That means best with a crossover cable, only for short distances, uh, but it's working very reliable there in this application area. And I would recommend to stay at DRBD if you have short distances in particular uh, crossover cables because it uses a very low space overhead. It uses a bitmap for storing information during the disconnect state. And this bitmap is the main difference to Mars. If you just compare the last line here, low space overhead, it uses transaction log files. Mars uses transaction log files for recording every write operation, but it records the writes in the exact same order as actually occurring on the device. That's the main difference to DRVD. The bitmap uses less space, but it does not record the order of, of operations. That's the central difference. Okay, and Mars is working asynchronously by default. Uh, the synchronous modes are in preparation, do not yet work, and uh, it's tailored for arbitrary distances. And the outcome of, the, of uh, remembering the order of right operations is just that you are consistent at any time, which is not the case with the RBD. Well, the second use case, you can buy a proprietary uh, addition called Proxy from Linbit, the maker of DRBD, and then you can also replicate over long distances, but the main drawback is buffering in RAM. The buffer is not on the file system or on the stable storage, it's in RAM. And if this RAM buffer gets lost, for example, if you have a network problem, then the buffer is killed then you have to resync all this lost data which was in the buffer. And this resync operation is not in order, it's out of order, and it's not an original order of operations, okay? So you have long inconsistencies during that resync, and the more you lose the buffer, the more data, amount of data you have to replicate then afterwards in the, during the resync phase. So, and this, that means if you have networking problems or if you're very slow network, you may end up with a permanently inconsistent mirror there. I'll show an example afterwards. Okay. Just the working model of Mars. It's more similar to databases. You can start with a pre-existing block device which already contains data and then you will load a kernel module called, called Mars, and then you get a virtual device, Def Mars my, my Data. You can write data in it or modify the data, and all your modifications, only the write operations are written to a transaction log file in the slash Mars file system, which must be have uh, uh, the right size for doing that. Okay, then the transaction log files is um, replicated through a long distance, to somewhere else, for example, to the planet Mars or wherever, but uh, it will, will not really work to Mars, to the planet Mars, because the TCP protocol will, will not work over this distance. <laughs> but in principle, the architecture of, of the 
software mouse is tailored for the planet Mars. Okay. So this is just applied to your replicated data. And that means the same operations are executed in the same order as originally, but of course it may happen later, 10 minutes later or whatever in this case. Now we get an, an example of DRVD problems. In this example, I assume that your network has a problem and I model it by a throughput limit which is just decreasing. And I'm also assuming that the network, that the application load is constant, just for this example, okay? So what will happen when, when you start? It's no problem uh, to solve your application throughput uh, through the network at the beginning, it's no problem. But uh, at some moment here, can I use a cursor here? Oh yes, at this point here, uh, you get a problem because DRBD is working synchronously. That means you have to write through all your write operations to the other side, to the secondary side. And it's, if it's not possible, you get high I.O. latencies and after a while DRBD has to disconnect automatically. Otherwise your application would get stuck or whatever. So you have an automatic disconnect and depending on DRBD configuration it tries to reconnect later. So during reconnect you have the first problem is that your application load is the same, constant. You cannot serve it, but there's an additional load here because of the resync traffic. All clear. So you have no chance to push it through the network bottleneck here. And what will be the outcome? It's very likely that your mirror <coughs> is inconsistent at the next disconnect, which sure, sure, surely will happen. If, it's not, if it has not been possible uh, to sync all your data, which has been dirty and, uh, dirtified in the meantime. So this damage is possibly permanently here. Okay? The average is not constructed for, for the case. If you have a crossover cable, it will not happen. Why? Because the crossover cable has is no network bottleneck. It either works or not. Okay? And DRD has also connect and disconnect binary behavior. And this binary behavior is just the right thing for, for crossover cable. So let's look at the difference to Mars. Mars is recording everything in transaction log file. And in case the network bottleneck does not allow replication of all your data, then the rest is recorded in the transaction log file. Okay, you can see the actual network throughput is this green line is following the red line here. And the application throughput, the difference, the area here is so the difference is recorded in the transaction log file. So this is the best possible behavior from a theoretical viewpoint. It just uses the network as best as possible. Now finally, let's look at an other example. Here we assume that the application throughput remains constant, but the network is flaky. This is a behavior which is observed very often in practice, for example, if you couple two data centers and you have lots of other jobs running backup processes or whatever, then you will notice that the network is not constant. The network is a type of bottleneck which can uh, float around by a factor of 10. I've, we have already uh, observed this at certain times during operations. And what will happen then, if the network is too slow, this area here is uh, the area of the amount of data which is recorded in the transaction log file and if the network gets better then it's caught up, okay? So this is also the best possible behavior you can get from this network. So this is the main idea of Mars. What's the current status? Uh, it's uh, GPL on GitHub. The next URL here is not yet ready because the technology domain is uh, one of the new top level domains, but it should be operational in, in a month or whatever. Uh, internally at one and one we have 15 pilot clusters running for several months, or some, even some older systems from last year or whatever. And we already started a rollout project uh, to more than 250 clusters. We are not yet migrating all our applications, but we are starting with the shared hosting and other application areas should follow in 
the next month or years or whatever. It takes a while to migrate everything. So this is our internal status at one and one. And then other interesting part for you is probably what's going up uh, with the software at GitHub or is it possible to get it into the kernel? This is my next big task. So I'm planning uh, to come out at the LKML mailing list in the next few months. And, and I'm currently preparing that. I'm just on the way of splitting Mars into three parts. There's a very generic framework doing, uh, it's hopefully usable by kernel developers for other things, not only Mars. Then are some freaks that are internal software components dealing with I.O. But not with bio, block I.O., but asynchronous I.O. with arbitrary granularity of requests. That's the main difference. So this is an infrastructure which could be used by kernel developers if, if they like. And then, of course, there's uh, the Mars Lite application. So I have uh, a three-layer architecture, the generic part, a first citizen. It's possible to implement other citizens, like stackable file systems or whatever, but it's all in the future. And there's a first application, Mars. And hopefully, it's attractive for kernel developers. And if it would succeed, it depends on Linux, but if it su would succeed, then you would get it in the standard distribution, which is the aim I Yes, question? Does it support uh, one to n uh, replication, or is it just uh, two nodes like the ODB case? It uh, supports more than two nodes. Currently, I have a, a bug, which uh, I've already fixed in a work in, in a VIP branch, uh, but uh, it's supposed to run to replicate to arbitrary many nodes. We all have uh, internally some scenarios, but it's not uh, the, f the first priority at the, at the current time. Yes? Um, on the slave nodes, is there any uh, sort of read-only functionality for the file system? Um, read-only? Yeah, so ah, you can okay. have the concept of, mm -hmm. uh, I know within the RPD, you can okay. set up the file system so you can still read from the slave if you need to. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you, you what, have a similar concept? Yes, yes. In some way, yes. <laughs> For example, you can um, set up a secondary node and just uh, stop uh, not the replication of the log files, but the application. As we, we have time, okay. I switch forward to the appendix. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I have three processes. One is uh, the, sec the primary side. And a write request comes in, it's buffered in a temporary memory buffer and first appended to the transaction log file in a sequential manner. Okay, this is crucial for performance. And then it's written back in background to the device in a different order, potentially. This is also crucial for performance. And then you have, this is the first process. This, the second process is the long distance transfer here. And the third process, is which can be switched on independently, is the apply of the log file. So you just stop the apply of the log file Say so stop for one hour, and then do read-only mounting or whatever. So this is the current solution. And of course, with Mars full and planned next release, uh, it's, it's a possible feature to implement snapshots or the like. Also read-only snapshots. If you like it, so we can talk about it. Yes? Sorry, please, loud. The application performance. Yes, I have also slides for that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a block replay uh, with a real load. Uh, you can, uh, for also the block replay project, uh, which does some benchmarking of, of block devices. And this scenario is about uh, 30,000 IOPS on a 50 spindle rate with the very fast disks, the 15K sp spinning disks, okay. And uh, parallelism is seven devices in parallel. And here we are using DRBD on a metro distance line, about 30 or 40 kilometers. So and what you can see here is uh, the latency diagram right out of the rights. The rights are some of the rights. The maximum here is, you can, is 70 seconds. So there was one request uh, which took 17 seconds. So we get some hangs due uh, to the network bottleneck. Okay. 
Now, what do you think? The next slide is Mar the same same scenario with Mars. Okay. Uh, look look at this uh, the scale in in the y-axis. This is one second here, and this is ten seconds. The previous slide got up to 100 here, yes? Not to confuse it. <laughs> the scale is different in the y-axis, okay? And of course, uh, the, the, re the writes are also slower because it has to write all the requests in two times. So the theoretical, in theory, it, uh, the worst case is uh, that it's two times slower, but in practice, with practical load, it has a re high random I.O. rate. Uh, then you, it's even 30% better than a raw device due to this write back strategy. But only if you um, allocate two, at least two gigabytes of RAM for this temporary buffer. So temporary is, uh, is uh, in this case, um, not really temporary. But uh, we have some storage servers which have a lot of RAM, so we can do that. This was a metro network, our own network. We are an AES, Autonomous System Provider, for, for ourselves. And this is a special line, dedicated line between two data centers, and, but lots of other applications are also running over it. Stuff, fiber, what No, it's, it's at, le at least 10 gig. I don't know okay. exactly. The, it's, and it's multiple paths and whatever, and oh. I don't know the details, but, but uh, backups are running over it, a lot of application traffic, of customer traffic, and so on. And you have some load peaks at several time, at certain times. And this, uh, the problem is uh, you always have a, a, a network bottleneck. You have thousands of servers, and then you're going to, let's say, two, three, or five lines, or whatever. So you have always uh, the multiplexing problem. You have lots of TCP channels which go physically through a low number of lines. And that's the problem, the principal problem which cannot be solved. If you, uh, if you have a faster line, it does not help really. Okay. What, uh, what synchronization method were you using in the DRVD? Was that C? Uh, a, we used all of them, A, B, and C. Okay. It does not help. Because if you have a stall, it, it, it just yeah. stalls at a different point. Just for the previous. The oh. previous. Oh. Don't know exactly. Is this our default? And I think the default is C. I'm not sure. The default is, should be C. It, it was a default configuration as from production. Okay, but, but I can send you the config file if you like. <laughs> okay. So lots of questions. Okay. Are you looking at migrating off TCP to some form of transport? That, uh, a different tra transports. Like okay. Yes. Well, uh, well, I, I have a, a developer branch which already uses multiple TCP connections in parallel. Uh, DRBD is stuck to one single connection, and here uh, I experimented with four parallel connections, and it's really a factor of four. But, but of course, uh, it, it's a heavier load for the line, then. and of course, it's stealing network bandwidth from other applications, of course. But you can use traffic shaping with Mars. You can you cannot do that with DRBD. Try it, and you get the problems of the previous slides. Okay, so th I think this is the pro uh, this is the, the main outcome. You can have several connections in parallel with TCP, and then um, traffic shape it. This is what I recommend. If you want to implement other protocols, it's no problem because it's encapsulated somewhere in a very special point in, in a single point. So if you want to implement other protocols, no problem from my side. And it's GPL. Um, about time for about. Just got one or two minutes, so one or two more questions. Yeah. Have you thought about multicast books for multicast? Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Okay. I experimented with multicast many years ago when I was at, at the University of Stuttgart. Yes. My experiences are not good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it is it a valid answer? <laughs> okay. So you can implement it, but good luck. <laughs> As an addition, probably. As an addition. One, one final. To, to what replication? CFS, CFS. Uh, cluster CFS. FS, yeah, yeah, yeah. ZFS. No, I never compared it because uh, we are replicating virtual machines or whatever, so it's a, on a different level. 
Um, it, yes, it's in a block level replication, so it does not directly compare to, uh, to ZFS or whatever replica replications. You could, of course, you can replicate with cluster FS, for example, which we had w done once, but uh, we just switched it off again and we got back to, to block level replication for good reasons. I don't want to go into details now. <laughs> okay, what, that was the last question? Okay.